Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, so all the on-campus students, have you settled? Fine, we'll get started. Okay, and uh, welcome to the online students as well. Okay, um, so we have some comments here uh, where you're saying the audio is not very clear. Is it better now? Ah, okay, it's fine now. Sure, then let's uh, proceed. We will pray and uh, then move ahead. Would one of the students like to lead in prayer, please? Anyone? Any volunteers? OK, there's a volunteer behind you. Hello. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for gathering us all here today, Heavenly Father. Please bless us, Heavenly Father. Guide us and lead us my towards day, Heavenly Father, and towards class, Heavenly Father. Please help us to understand what Nancy is teaching, Heavenly Father. And please do use my Nancy and my Heavenly Father as an instrument, Heavenly Father, to help understand your word much better, Heavenly Father. Please reveal us new things, Heavenly Father, to Nancy and Heavenly Father. And please help us to keep in mind, Heavenly Father. And thank you once again for gathering us all here today, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, so in the last class, uh, if you would recall, we talked about travailing. OK. And we said before that, we talked about persistence. So while there are answers to prayer, which may be immediate in many situations, sometimes there is a need for us to labor. And the results don't come unless we spend that kind of time and that kind of intimate, intense time with the Lord. So there is a place for both. Some um, answers, some outcomes are quite quick. Whereas for some others, we have to be persistent. We've seen how Elijah, though there was a promise of God's word over his life, he still prayed. Uh, and without that kind of prayer, I don't think the answer would have come to him. So both are applicable in our lives and we need the, uh, the prompting of the Holy Spirit to guide us. Sometimes what we tend to do is we um, give up because we think God is not answering my prayer or I'm not in the will of God or you know we come up with some conclusion for why we don't have the answer. But it might simply mean that the prayer request falls in the category of persistence. Okay, and not just persistence, we saw the value of um, travailing or laboring in birth. So when we look at the example of Apostle Paul, you know, he says that I, I uh, labored more abundantly than any of the apostles. So not just in hard work, but even in prayer. So there were things which were a part of his ministry that came to fruition or that that happened only after engaging intensely in prayer with God. So we saw how he said in Galatians 4 19 that, uh, you know, I lab labor to to, um, you know, birth, see Christ birthed in you. So uh, there is a hard work, so to speak, that we have to do in prayer. And uh, it's only when we put in that kind of uh, time and effort and energy into, uh, it, it's called laboring or working in prayer, that we can see the results. Now, we might have many questions. Why do we have to uh, pray? Why can't the word, if God said it, it's powerful. Why can't it just happen? Now, we don't know all the reasons why. One, of course, is timing. Uh, because we said that there are certain requests that will come through only um, in God's appointed time. Okay, we talked about the Kairos. Uh, and there are many other reasons. You know, There can be demonic hindrances. Maybe when we are praying, the, the hindrances are overcome. Uh, or it could be that you know the, the growth of character which we are expecting can happen only through this kind of sowing in prayer. So there are many reasons why it might take longer than what we have uh, you know thought uh, it, it would. But we choose to work 
or the word labor is used or we also talked about how uh, a mother who is giving birth she labors and she travails she travails and we saw the example of israel that uh, uh, you know she gave birth immediately even before the midwives could come she gave birth uh, immediately so what god is saying is he is saying that when we travel we do our part there will be a time and a season where the answers will come quickly at that time you would look at it and say oh it happened suddenly or quickly or immediately but the point is labor has gone in and we must be willing to labor and uh, we said especially when it comes to salvation you know some of our family members loved ones or salvation of um, uh, you know our, our state our city uh, we might look at people who've been praying for so many years and wonder what is this so many people are praying but we haven't seen you know whatever revival or people turning in large numbers to the lord uh, but we join the labor okay now we don't know how and when god is going to release the answers but we join the labor without the labor going in uh, we cannot expect to see the results so uh, you know just begin to work with the lord and you know we saw how there were some people their life examples like um, father nash you know we saw how they they um, cried out to god they spent you know many days of their life just in the presence of god crying out and uh, we could see the results that uh, through the crusades many people were actually saved so there is a value in laboring and traveling and it must be a part of our lives it must be a part of our lives now uh, certain aspects yes you know all these spiritual things salvation healing for all that we travel maybe in our own personal lives there could be certain matters that you know we have come before the uh, we brought it to the lord but it's taking so much time uh, we know that it's in the will of god but you know it's a struggle so you're wondering why is this not happening i'm praying for people but you know they are getting the answers they are getting healed but in my own personal life i'm not getting a breakthrough in um, you know whatever certain situations uh, but the right thing to do is just labor just labor you never know you know what's the right time that god would release the breakthrough okay so now that is the value of laboring and traveling now today we will talk a little bit more about uh, um, intercession but intercession as a ministry so we talked about um you know what intercession is we said that jesus when he hung on the cross that was an act of intercession we no longer need to do that act of intercession because as the book of hebrews says there was only one sacrifice complete perfect sacrifice uh, uh, which was made for our salvation and that is the lord jesus christ so that is done that's a done deal on the, this side of the cross our responsibility is to pray and jesus also said right he also said and you will pray um, and you know you you will receive when you ask in my name so he indicated that believers will pray so we can pray for ourselves which we simply term as prayer but we can also pray for others which is what we term as intercession so when one goes before the lord for somebody else that is intercession okay so today we are looking at intercession as a ministry what is ministry you think what what do you think ministry is what is ministry uh, it's a question even for our online students so you can type it in the chat what is ministry how okay how god uses us to minister to others what is minister serving okay very good so ministry is service okay even if you look up the greek words where you have this ministry term it simply means service okay so we are here to serve others that is the meaning of ministry if somebody says i am in ministry basically what you're doing is you're you're 
in the service of God. You are in the service of His people. That is what ministry means. So today we are looking at, yeah. So the one comment here also says serving. Uh, okay, Jashin. Thanks, Jashin, for that. Uh, today we are looking at how we can serve others through prayer. Now, serving people, let's say through um, you know preaching, or um, uh, you know. Take anything else through maybe music. Some of us, we may not have that aptitude. We may not be built for, you know, uh, preaching or all of you are so musical. I always appreciate whenever I come to Bible college, I'm like, wow, every one of you is so talented. Whenever we hear, you know, you guys uh, are singing and playing on your instruments. But, you know, uh, I don't know if I can serve like that because I don't have the aptitude for it. But you know, here is something that everyone can do. And we all have the aptitude for this kind of ministry. And that is prayer. Everyone can do it, no matter which age, uh, you know, what our age is. We could be much very old in our age. Uh, we could be a little child. OK, we could be anywhere in between but here is a ministry or service that everyone can be involved in and this ministry is the ministry of prayer now we might ask the question yeah we pray for others but how is it ministry okay how is it how can you uh, classify it with all, all the other things that people do you know, being an apostle, being a prophet, being this and that, and serving in their ways, that is ministry. How can prayer be ministry? But, you know, you see in scripture that prayer is very much something that we can do in service for others. Now, others may know that we are praying for them or others may never know that we are praying for them. So in that sense, it's a ministry um, you know, in which we have to be very secure in ourselves. You know, sometimes when we come up to the pulpit and we preach, there are many people, they will come and say, oh, pastor, you spoke so well. When you said that, it touched my heart. And, you know, you get appreciation. Uh, sometimes when you're in front of people or you're leading in worship, people will come and applaud. They'll say, oh, how beautifully you sang. It was so anointed, this and that. But when we pray, Nobody may even know that we have prayed, right? Uh, but it's a very selfless service, OK? Are we willing to do that service where we may never get applause from people? So you have to be very secure in your identity in Christ. Yes, sometimes people may recognize. Sometimes you get to meet the people that you're praying for, and you might say, I was praying for you, or something. Then you get an appreciation or a thank you. Oh, thank you so much. God has worked in my life. But what if you never let people know right, that you have prayed for them? And what if they never say thank you, never appreciate? Are you OK? Would you still pray? But that is the question. So the ministry of prayer is a ministry Thank you, Kiran. Uh, ministry of Prayer uh, is a ministry in which we have to determine before God that, Lord, I'm serving in this way. It's for your glory. It's not so that people would recognize me. In fact, I think for every ministry, we should have that heart. Isn't it? It's not about pleasing people, but it is more about pleasing the heart of God. So this is a very special ministry, uh, which is to pray for people. Now, in the New Testament, uh, there is a particular person by the name of Epaphras who uh, had a ministry of an intercessor. Or his ministry itself was prayer. So now we have to understand, you know, there are, there are levels of ministry. For example, 
when we prophesy okay all believers can prophesy to you know some extent but we talk about the grace gift of prophecy where uh, there are some people who are in the ministry prophetic ministry okay so they have god's grace on their lives to have that prophetic ministry so that's another level all believers can prophesy but there are some people who have a prophetic ministry and there are some people who are in the office of the prophet so we we term them as prophets okay we don't term others as prophets but we term the people who are in the office of a prophet as prophet so you see there are levels so in the same way everyone can pray but there are some people who have the ministry of prayer okay are you understanding what i'm saying yeah so some people have the ministry of prayer so in the bible this person known as epaphras you know he had the ministry of prayer where did you know this this person come to know the lord and uh, uh, you know start to serve god so we see in paul's missionary journeys we um, notice that he went around strengthening churches and uh, during his third missionary journey he spent a lot of time in a city called as ephesus and over there he spent about 3 years and we read that he was given a space you know like a bible college like this so paul was given a space where he could run a school and he could train up people just like you any people were coming to ephesus from the surrounding regions and paul was teaching the word of god he was teaching the word of god and equipping you know people who came there so epaphras was one of those men who had attended paul's school uh, and he was from a place called as colosse okay so that is who epaphras is um, and you know there's a little bit which is mentioned about um, uh, epaphras we will we will okay we will read the scriptures uh, in a moment and we also see that paul writes a letter to the colossians okay he writes a letter to the colossians there are different churches corinthians uh, you know a church in thessalonica thessalonians philippians there are many different churches so paul writes a letter to the colossians they are the colossian church and the person who most likely started this church is epaphras he's the one okay uh, so you see that the, he is a wonderful minister of god and he came from the church of colosse uh, and also we see that when paul was imprisoned uh, epaphras came and you know he spent time with paul so this is this is who epaphras is and there are a few things that paul writes about epaphras in the book of colossians so uh, could somebody read colossians 4 verses 12 and 13 and then one more person can read colossians 1 and verse 7 so we'll look at these scriptures and then discuss a little bit more okay avimal uh, mic please if okay um uh, you're going to read it okay fine go ahead Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear with him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Okay, uh, Colossians one seven. Anyone? You learned of God's grace from Epaphras, uh, our dear fellow servant, who is Christ's faithful worker on our behalf. Okay, great. So, uh, thank you for reading these verses. Colossians four, verses twelve and thirteen. There's a mention of Epaphras because Epaphras is with Paul, and Paul is in prison. That's the time when Paul is writing to the Colossian church, and he makes a mention of his co-worker Epaphras. So he says, Epaphras, who is one of you. who is a colossian a born servant of christ greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers so you notice 
what is he saying about Epaphras? He's not saying he's praying for you, but he's using the terms he is always laboring fervently. So through prayer, there is some hard work that somebody needed to do. And Epaphras is the one who is doing it. He is laboring fervently for you, meaning he's interceding for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Okay, so many nice things we can learn from this. I will share with you, you know, what um, uh, we understand from this. So you notice the term a born servant of Christ, Epaphras, a born servant of Christ is used. Now, if you read many of Paul's letters, he calls himself also, you know, I'm a born servant of Christ. But who was Paul? Like his, um, you know, his, his ministry gift, like what offices do you think he stood in? Preaching, yeah. So can we say apostle? Yes, isn't it? So that was a prophecy over his life and all that. So Paul, an apostle and a born servant of Christ. Usually the term born servant was used for somebody who's in you know, that kind of a position. But see what Paul is saying about Epaphras. He's saying, Epaphras, a born servant of Christ. So basically what it tells us is that there is an honor which Paul placed on an individual who was an intercessor. Okay? So should intercessors be valued? Should they be honored? Yes, look at Paul. He is using a term comparative to what was used for, like, you know, apostles, born servant of Christ. And that's what he uses to describe Epaphras. So there's great value, you know, uh, for an intercessor. What else? Laboring fervently. Okay, laboring fer fervently. Laboring fervently tells me that he was not casually praying. There's a difference. See, when you are intentional, for example, if you take an Olympic race and somebody is chosen for that Olympic race, they are preparing for it. They labor fervently because they have a goal in mind. You know, I have to. I have to wake up whatever, uh, 5 a.m. I have to do my exercises. I have to eat right. I have to. I cannot waste time. I am preparing for the Olympics. Laboring fervently. But what is casual? Somebody who just likes to run. Today morning I woke up. I ran. Tomorrow I didn't wake up. It's okay. Casual. So Epaphras labored fervently simply tells us he intentionally worked hard in prayer. Something like travail. Travail and, uh, you know, uh, laboring, you know, in, in birth for Christ to be formed in people. So he had an intention. And you can also look at it like, you know, laboring fervently is not just hard work, but it's a struggle. You know, and it's not easy, isn't it? When you are not seeing the answer like Elijah. Okay, go, see. Has it come or not? Second time, he's praying. Go, see and come. Do you think it's it's like a fight? And a, you, you are fighting, you're contending, you're struggling to see something fulfilled. Isn't it? That's how it looks to me. So laboring fervently is not just hard work, but someone who's willing to struggle in prayer unless you see the results. So he... Paul is giving honor to Epaphras and saying, he's a born servant of Christ. He labored. You know, he's laboring fervently in prayers for you. Okay? Uh, and what is the intention? Why is he laboring fervently? So that he sees you perfect and complete. Isn't it? That's what Paul is saying. What is perfect and complete? What is perfect, perfect and complete? Yeah, just give it a shot. It's okay. 
yeah without any defects okay that's the simple meaning perfect and complete so what is a perfect and complete for a believer okay when would we say a believer is perfect and complete okay when they are growing in prayer yes when you're walking the bible through the bible okay through the bible okay good so praying walking through the bible anything else okay no worries you tell me and then i'll take her answer okay so when others begin to notice that god is working through your life okay okay so you you fulfill the will of god okay through your life when you believe that okay we believe that jesus is our savior and we walk in his will okay so good good answers uh, but most of you shared the process and someone's praying walking with the lord all that process okay but perfect and complete means end point to know him okay to know him and okay taking responsibility that's also process shall we say see because here we usually say okay believer disciple uh, minister leader so that journey you have to make that journey all right so becoming a believer is only starting point so much more is there in the journey before god so what is that end result that every believer yes when your faith is completely completely refined okay good finally reach heaven okay no i am talking more this side of heaven so i'm talking more earth when you become a leader okay what is that i'm asking you, what is that final point exactly to be like jesus isn't it okay <laughs> so prince is getting a hand clap so this was labor what we did just now is labor okay trying to fight and struggle and come up with the answer so at least we got the answer so this is how uh, you know prayer is so that laboring fervently perfect and complete is each of you and me all of us we become like jesus okay by that we simply mean like jesus in character like jesus in power isn't it so become like jesus in character and like jesus in power that is perfect and complete so paul is saying Epaphras is laboring and working hard in prayer is going to lead to believers becoming perfect and complete in Christ. Now, can you think of any other ministry through which people can be made perfect and um, you know complete in like become more like Jesus? Any other service? is offered to people through which they can become more like jesus yes yeah, serving how what kind of serving hmm? okay helping each other okay so take for example all of you are sitting in front of me i want you to become more like jesus which ministry can i use to make you more like jesus love yes which service i'm doing it right now teaching teaching preaching why because we are bringing the word you know which is able to do its work in our lives and when the word works in my life i will become more and more like jesus so for somebody to become more perfect and complete 
you know, we generally think of ministries like preaching, teaching, right? And then you have other aspects like mentoring, discipling, all that we think. But we don't think prayer. How can prayer help believers become complete and perfect? But what is Paul saying? He's saying through the ministry of prayer of Epaphras, the Colossians, they are moving to becoming complete and perfect in Christ. So it just tells me that prayer is also, you know, somewhere in, in, in that category of ministries which is serving believers so powerfully. We should not underestimate the ministry of prayer. If somebody is praying, interceding, laboring fervently, we can see the results of that upon the lives of believers. Are you all with me? Am I confusing you or is it clear? You are understanding. OK, great. Yeah. Yes, Anand. Mm. Um, the the person who's doing the ministry, uh, what about them? Can they change lives? So that's what we are seeing. Okay. The other things like preaching, teaching, all that. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe they're only praying. But even if they're only praying, it can result in Christ being formed in people. Okay. It, is that uh, any other follow up question to that? Hmm. Okay, good question. So uh, what uh, Anand and Prince are saying is, if we pray, okay, we are doing our part, what about the people who have to make the right decisions? But don't you think it's applicable even for preaching? Like, like if I am laboring in the word of God and I'm teaching the word of God, even then believers have to make the right decision for the word to work in their life, isn't it? So I think personal responsibility is always there, no matter which ministry uh, you know we are engaging in. And though it's not mentioned in the Bible, we know that personal responsibility is very, very important. See, because I'll tell you one example. Mm, yeah, Paul. Um, OK. Mm, OK, so uh, there's, there's a scripture in which you know, we see that the word that we hear, okay, it must be mixed with faith. If it is not mixed with faith, then it will not yield anything. So when we are preaching the word, it's possible that people come Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, listen, listen, listen to the messages. Now, five years down the line, you might find that if there are 10 people, five people have grown spiritually and they've gone to another place in their walk with the Lord. But maybe five people, just an example, five people, they are still where they started. So same person is preaching, same sermon, same way to 10 people. But the result is completely different. So what does it tell me? There is always personal responsibility. Though it's not mentioned, sometimes it's not mentioned in between the lines, personal responsibility. Epaphras can pray. But if people are still unwilling, obviously, you know, the uh, you won't see the results. Yes.
Yes, yes. So you mean the other people, meaning the preacher or other prayer warriors with him? OK, prayer warriors and the preacher. Yes. Yeah. So uh, OK, so the question is, in this um, you know, Great Awakening, where Charles Finney, uh, you know, he was one of the, the um, uh, preachers, and Father Nash would support him through prayer. Uh, the question is, was there no effort by the preacher? Was all the result because of the prayer ministry of Father Nash? What I would say, Anand, is in this particular example, it's not that there was no effort by the preacher, but we would look at it in terms of, you know, we generally use the word like anointing and things like that. Okay, we won't get too technical. But when Father Nash was engaging in prayer, we can say that there was that power which was created. So though the preacher is preaching, there was this additional power which was released uh, for souls to be saved. Okay, The preacher did make an effort, but the power which was generated by the intercessory ministry was huge. That's how you look at it. So when Nash was not there, Finney himself, he shares that you know, he continued to make the effort that he made, but this was missing, the power which was generated through prayer. So results were not good enough. OK. Did it make sense to you? Yes. Hmm. Yes, yes, definitely. See, so the way we look at this is um, when we pray, okay, based on scripture. So there are there are many uh, promises we can claim. We are going to look at it also. We, how to pray for the family, how to pray for people who have gone away from God, how to pray for the lost, how to pray for the city. We will look at all that. So, you know, we do our part. And if I may just... For our understanding, you know, put a uh, just simply I'm putting a number, it's not there in the Bible. But you see, 90% of the work like you're doing in prayer, now the 10% will depend on the individuals and their decisions also. We are not saying that, but it is understood. Now, after doing all the praying, if an individual still says, No, I don't want, I will live however, however I like. Through prayer, we cannot control. We will study that also. You can't control people because free will is free will. But here is the, the, the good part. You can do 90% of the work through prayer. So why not do it? You know, and what 10% people choose to do, that person chooses to do, that is not in my hand. I can't be worried about that. So all we are saying is God has provided for us to get that you know 90% advantage through prayer so do it okay so that's the point uh, any i saw some hand going up okay fine so i think we've understood you know quite a bit yes uh, and there are some comments here on the chat but we've gone you know way uh, beyond you know, that part of uh, the question I was asking, these are all answers for that. So thank you. OK, so we noticed that uh, you know prayer ministry is very important. And people who are engaged in prayer ministry also have the same goal as somebody who may be preaching and teaching, you know, who may be an apostle or you know, any, any other category. So it helps believers. It helps believers. And uh, in that passage of Colossians 4, we also notice that um, there is a zeal. Okay, what is zeal? Passion. Okay, very good. So there is a zeal which Epaphras has for the people. So look at this. All this is giving us better understanding about prayer ministry. You know, prayer ministry, sometimes it's understood as it is a burden. Like, you know, people, oh, I'm stuck. I'm only in prayer ministry. I have to pray for the people. You know, the attitude is such that there is no passion in it. But 
passion is a part of the prayer ministry. Now, if you take, for example, you know, preaching, um, we hear of all these preachers, they're going to go to mountainous regions and, you know, difficult places. They don't mind. They take one Bible, they go, they preach and, you know, they come back passionately share all these stories. I met so-and-so, they didn't know about Jesus and they gave their life to Christ. So you see the passion in their, in their ministry. Even when it comes to prayer, okay, based on what Paul is saying about Epaphras, there is a passion. Some You can imagine with me, somebody who is praying for the believers to be perfect and complete. And every day, you know, he wakes up with that same thing in his heart. Okay, I'm going to pray. Those believers are going to become stronger in God and the church will be strong. They will make an impact. So somebody who's passionate, okay, through the prayer ministry. So we have to, you know, have this kind of a thinking that when there is a ministry in prayer, it does not have to be boring. You know, it does not have to be um, burdensome. Sometimes we think, oh, I couldn't do any other ministry, so I'm doing prayer ministry. You know, it's it's too heavy when you look at it like that. But prayer ministry is not like that. It's a special ministry where uh, Paul is honoring an intercessor. Paul is saying that the labor is equal to the kind of labor that, you know, a preacher would do. And the fact that the intercessor is passionate. Okay. And that prayer is not, you know, difficult, uh, unpleasant work for the uh, person. So this is the beauty of prayer ministry. So let me quickly touch on one more point here. And uh, then we, we can take a break and come back. So the other point here is, notice there are two places which are mentioned. Okay, Those two places are Laodicea and Herapolis. So these places, Paul is saying that um, Epaphras, he prays for the Colossians and he also prays for people in Laodicea and Herapolis. So here is another beautiful thing about prayer ministry. There is no distance. Okay. There is no distance in the ministry of prayer. So if you look up these places. Uh, you know, one of those places was 12 miles away from Colosse. Another place was four yeah, 14 miles away from Colosse. So 12 miles away and 14 miles away. So Epaphras being in Colosse could pray for people in two different cities. So today, you and I, you know, we are sitting in Bangalore. But we can successfully have a prayer ministry um, for the state of, I mean, name any state. You, know, you could be praying for Nagaland, you could be praying for um, Odisha, you could be praying for Uttar Pradesh, you could be pray you could be praying for the nations of the world. Will, will it be effective? What do you see here? Yes. So this is the beauty of the ministry in prayer. There is no distance. Okay, so distance is not a limitation as far as intercession is concerned. Okay, so let's do one thing. We will take a break right now. We will come back, you know, have some question answers and then continue with the next chapter here. So let's go for a break. <laughs> 